It was July 1788 when North Carolina's convention met to discuss the ratification of the Constitution. Nearly a year after debate had ended at the Philadelphia Convention where the who's who of the founding generation had hammered out details about the binding document. On the first day of the Tar Heel State's convention, the radical anti-federalist Willie Jones moved the group to vote without a debate. However, despite Jones's reluctance, the convention agreed to debate, but at the end of the day the anti-federalists outnumbered the federalists and the convention voted against ratifying the Constitution. But why? Welcome everyone to Half History Will Travel. I am your host, The Wilder Historian, and in this video we will explore the reasons that North Carolina fought against the Constitution that will help explain the social, political, and economic situation of the founding era. When the Constitution question came up in North Carolina, it created two distinct factions, those who wanted to keep the old aristocratic order in the colonies called conservatives, and the group who was more radical and ultimately more democratic by wanting to get away from any kind of aristocracy called the radicals. This division became even more evident when the monetary policies are concerned. The conservatives favored a hard currency backed up by the federal government, and the radicals supported the printing of paper money and reliance on local political systems. The issuing of soft money would allow more people to physically have money in their hands, and this would ultimately help the lower rungs of society. The conservatives were happy with the Constitution because it would secure the political power they already enjoyed. But the radicals feared that the Constitution was too restrictive, and it was this group that supported a Bill of Rights to the document to secure rights that may be overstepped by a centralized government. The Federalists or Conservatives argued that a Bill of Rights was not needed because the three branches of government would provide a system of checks and balances that would prevent the central government from overstepping its bounds, and the Anti-Federalists or Radicals called back to the Revolutionary War and argued that there needed to be restrictions because without explicit laws protecting the civil rights of citizens, then the United States government could become what Great Britain had become and what they had overthrown. Up until the North Carolina Convention in Hillsborough, most citizens had not heard a well-defended argument for or against the Constitution. Most of their information was gathered through word of mouth from people who had never studied the debate themselves. Therefore, there were lots of misinformation about the various reasons for the Constitution. Even the newspapers in North Carolina were sporadic, small, and not widely distributed. So misinformation ran rampant in the state. One reason for the lack of newspapers is the large but dispersed population and the lack of a capital city. The General Assembly of the state would just meet in the town where the governor lived, so it traveled around and contributed to the lack of information. The lack of population and lack of money combined to limit supporters of the Constitution, particularly merchants and businessmen, because there were few or limited economic centers to produce those types of gentlemen. Although a barter system was well established, there still needed to be hard money in circulation to pay for wholesalers, particularly British merchants who ultimately wanted to be paid in hard currency. Businessmen and merchants could not gain a firm foothold in the state because of these factors, and those types of men were big pushers of ratification of the Constitution. Finally, sectional conflict and controversy was the natural product of differences in geography, agriculture, and population across North Carolina. At the root of the conflict between the eastern and western parts of the state was a disparity in apportionment and representation in the state legislature. Counties sent five delegates each to the General Assembly, along with one for each borough town of Edenton, Bath, Newburn, Wilmington, Brunswick, Halifax, Campbellton, Salisbury, and Hillsborough. This meant that the eastern part of North Carolina, where there were counties, was represented by 61 of the 78 delegates even though in 1771, only 103,700 white people, or 41% of the population, lived in the East. The 124,000 residents of the western part of North Carolina were represented by only 17 delegates. Put differently, in the East, the ratio of representation was one for every 1,700 people, while in the West, it was one for every 7,300 people. The Tidewater interest in the General Assembly employed the same strategy used in Virginia to maintain their numerical advantage. Every time a county was added in the backcountry, one of the Tidewater counties would be split to create more seats. The state of North Carolina became divided, east versus west, and a bitter fight, literally and figuratively, broke out between the two sides. 
When the counties were to elect members of the General Assembly in 1787, some elections were said to be fraudulent. William Hooper, a signer of the Declaration of Independence, got in a fist fight with an anti-federalist who bested him and gave him two black eyes. The choice of delegates for the Hillsborough Convention for the ratification debate was not any more civil. Radical Thomas Person hurled insults at the delegates for even considering ratifying the Constitution and called George Washington a rascal and traitor to his country for putting his hand to such a paper as the new Constitution. In Dobbs County, as the election inspector was counting the votes and the Anti-Federalists took a comfortable lead, the Federalists beat the sheriff senseless and stole the ballot box. The inspector jumped out of the window to avoid being victimized himself. Another election yielded a Federalist victory, but the Hillsborough Convention delegates refused to seat any delegates from Dobbs County since the election was contested. In the convention, the delegates brought up many issues, but none more important to each side as the state's finances and how it related to the federal government. Radicals wanted more paper money pumped into the state's economy so that citizens would have money to pay their debts and to buy things for daily life. However, issuing too much paper money depreciated each piece of currency. Radicals combated the depreciation by arguing that the state could legislate against the depreciation, giving the state lots of power. But even if the money was worth more within North Carolina, other states would not accept its bills because of its volatility. Conservatives wanted to restrict the money supply which would hurt the lower classes, but would protect the integrity of the currency and allow North Carolina to trade domestically and internationally. By the end of the debate, radicals did relent that the money system would need to be more stable, but still fought for a more democratic solution. Going along with the debate over the financial system, the delegates debated the federal government's right to tax. The anti-federalists believed that having a federal entity taxing the states would place an unmovable burden on the citizens' shoulders. The Federalists pointed out that if the federal government could tax, then North Carolina could lessen its tax burden on its own citizens and use federal dollars to complete infrastructure too expensive for state taxes. Ultimately, the Radicals won out and voted against ratification. With the action taken by the Hillsborough Convention, the place of North Carolina in the Union changed instantaneously and dramatically. North Carolina was now a foreign or independent state it could have no part in selecting the first president, no role in devising the constitutional amendments on which the convention majority had insisted, and no participation in a general constitutional convention were called. Formative national laws would be enacted without its voice and would not apply to it. It and Rhode Island were the outliers, islands surrounded by a united nation upon which it depended heavily for economic trade. Hugh Williamson, who was still serving in Congress at the close of the Hillsborough Convention, sat in a unique position for North Carolina at this juncture. He was a federal official in a government his state no longer belonged to. From New York, he penned an apology on behalf of North Carolina, hoping to engender sympathy and benevolence toward his state on the part of the new federal union. Williamson cited North Carolina's valiant service to the nation during the American Revolution and argued its continued loyalty despite its refusal to ratify the Constitution. A Bill of Rights, he argued, could be appended to the Constitution without North Carolina's assistance, and once the Constitution had been amended, he felt that North Carolina stood ready to rejoin the Union. Furthermore, even from its position on the outside, North Carolina would support the Federal Union. Williamson's letter is one piece of evidence that North Carolina never considered itself severed from the United States entirely and even believed that its loyalty to the Union was paramount. North Carolina was no longer a member of the United States. The law of the United States, past and future, would cease to operate at its borders. No federal court would be established in North Carolina, nor would the courts of the United States have jurisdiction over North Carolinians. No delegation to Congress would be ceded from North Carolina, and no North Carolinian would occupy a federal post. United States Customs would not establish an office in North Carolina ports, the treaties of the United States would no longer extend to North Carolina, and the United States would not be obliged to defend North Carolina if it came under attack. Another problem for the Tar Heels was that the United States tariffs on imported goods from foreign nations now applied to them. This also meant that other foreign nations would be less inclined to use ports in North Carolina to access other United States ports because that would increase the taxes levied on their goods. Combine this with the already horrible financial system that North Carolina had, and it's a recipe for disaster. 
Along the same lines, now North Carolina had to deal with its own Revolutionary War debt, which if they had joined the United States in ratifying the Constitution, then the Union would have taken on that responsibility. This further hurt the Tar Heel State. While in Hillsborough, the Federalists had understood very well that they were speaking for the record. Two Federalists had hired a reporter to record the details of the debate as they transpired. They believed that if the public read the debates for themselves, they would side with ratification. In June 1789, printers published and distributed thousands of copies across the state, a much wider circulation than any newspaper in North Carolina at the time. The proceedings were widely read and discussed, and many people began to realize the advantages of ratification. Thanks in large part to the persuasive arguments Iredell had advanced in the debates, the printed proceedings proved invaluable in securing the election of more Federalists in 1789, and finally swaying the public opinion in favor of the Constitution. Archibald McLean thought their publication and distribution was the single most important step that could be taken in its favor and moving forward. The Federalists also distributed copies of President George Washington's address to North Carolina urging ratification, believing that the stable and favorable formation of the federal government would induce more support for the Constitution. Once people heard the whole arguments and the words of George Washington, the public turned against the Anti-Federalists. They made effigies of the radicals and burned them to show their displeasure with them. The General Assembly of the state decided to meet again in November 1789 to decide on ratification. After a three-day debate, the delegation voted 194 to 77 in favor of ratification, thus bringing North Carolina into the Union. Misinformation and lack of information led to the public not understanding the true debate for ratification. But once that information was distributed to the public, they understood the utility in joining the United States. Thank you all so much for watching. Please share the video to spread the word about the channel. Have a great day, and I'll see you next time. Historian, historian, where do you roam? Historian, historian, far, far from home. If history will travel, he's the card of a man. A professor with knowledge in the heartland. To educate the world. A professor of fortune is a man called Historian Historian